for us to walk in. And I want to, before I kind of give this message, I just, my, my challenge is this to us. There's been so many scriptures that be, have become more alive during this time. And one of them is where Paul says, buy up the opportunities for the days are evil. There is an amazing opportunity before us as the body of Christ. And it's going to remain with us for probably some time. And I, I think at some point we have to make a choice because, I, you know, honestly, I'm as human as the next guy. And a lot of things that have transpired, a lot of things that have happened can, can like, breed frustration in you. Right? I don't get this. I don't understand this. I don't know this. But at some point, I've got to make a choice that either I'm going to walk out of frustration or I'm going to look and I'm going to go, wow, God, you have created an amazing, amazing opportunity. And your word says to buy up the opportunities because the days are evil. And so we got to make a choice. Like, am I going to live in the frustration of this or am I going to buy up this opportunity and take every chance I get to be a distributor and a carrier of hope? Right? Because people are looking for hope. People are scared. People are nervous. And, and some of it I look at and I shake my head and God goes, yeah, but you know what? There's an amazing opportunity right there. Right? Because they are afraid. Because they don't know me. And, and that passage of scripture in Matthew 6 where Jesus said, he who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the house that's built on the rock and the storm beats against it and maybe there's a door out of adjustment. And maybe there's a broken window, but the house is going to stand and people are going to look and they're going to go, how is that? Right? And, and so what do I have to say, right, as the storm is easing? Because I will guarantee you this isn't going away anytime soon. And the next time the flu hits, people are going to freak out. Are you going to be ready? Right? Because buy up the opportunity. Buy up the opportunity. You can talk about how silly it is all you want, but it's an opportunity. And as the body of Christ, right, this is what we're called to, is be to be distributors of hope, carriers of hope, because he is the God of peace, right? And so this is kind of where like, the vein that, that I'm going to move into, and I, and I can be as guilty of anybody else. I find myself in the conversations, and where do they move? Well, this is silly. This is stupid. This is dumb. Okay, okay. It is, it is, it is. There's a lot of it to do. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm really not encouraging you in that. I'm just, right? Yeah. Come on. All right. Yeah. Shut me down when I'm preaching. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to try to set a tone for where we are and uh, what we are called to do as God's family here on earth. We're, we're in a time of a new normal with some things. It was funny, I got a chance to go out. There's a bus that comes every day and brings food for the kids uh, from the school district. And I've been, we've been so busy working out here in the, in the foyer trying to get things done that really haven't had a chance to just go out and like introduce myself. And so on Friday, I went out, and the ladies were there, and I was just talking to her, and I said that new normal, and she goes, I gotta be honest. She goes, I hate that term. <laughs> I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, but but it is, there are some things that will never be the same, right? And that means that there's a new normal that we're living in. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we want to go back or not, we just can't. And so you go, well, all right, I'm gonna buy up the opportunities, and because if things change, that means there's new opportunities. And sometimes I think God shakes things up because, like, we need new opportunities. And we've got lots of those right now. And uh, some things are good and then some things are not so good. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time in camp here. But I do want to throw out a self-check for us because I've noticed kind of a disturbing trend across the board. And, and that is, um, and this is the self-check. This is kind of, and I find this in myself, and I just kind of hear this as people talk. Don't allow the fear of uncertainty to create phobic behavior in your everyday 
living. Okay? And so as, as the body of Christ, um, uncertainty is scary, right? Uncertainty is unnerving. If you are uncertain about something, don't ask them, that causes a level of, of nervousness, and that can cause us to kind of live in a certain way. And, and it's just funny because, you know, you they're, they're, I, 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 I'm not into all the statistics, but the, the last I heard, there was like, they didn't have any cases in Flathead County, right, COVID-19. But it's funny when you go out and, and you go into a store, and not every place, but you walk into an aisle and somebody looks at you and they look at you like you're like the Chainsaw Massacre guy with the chainsaw, right? <laughs> and it's like, wow, I forget to brush my teeth. What is it? <laughs> you know, and it, and it creates this, this phobic, this fear that controls me, right? And that's what phobia is. It's a fear that controls and it determines how I live. And so don't let the uncertainty create phobic behavior in our every day living. Um, choose whatever statistics you want, okay? There's a lot of statistics out there, but chances are very high, very high, that COVID-19 is not what will kill you. <laughs> I'm going to bring you some good news here. Consider the reality of the current situation. Uh, it's not COVID-19 that's paralyzing people's lives. It's the uncertainty of what is going on around them. Okay? And I think we need to realize that. It, it's not the reality of this bug that's getting people, it's the uncertainty that it has brought into their lives that's creating much of the behavior, but it's also creating the opportunity, right? Uncertainty creates opportunity, and we have to know that. Uncertainty can create a lot of things. It can create phobic behavior, or it creates opportunity. And as a body of Christ, I look out there and I go, wow, there's going to be opportunity because of the uncertainty. And that's where, right? Right? When somebody they start talking about that, instead of getting sucked into the conversation, the ability to look at somebody and go, wow, sounds like you're uncertain about some things. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, right? Because it's the uncertainty that's affecting them, not the virus. Right? Yeah. Right? Isn't that true? No, yeah. well, it is. That's just the truth. All right, all right. Disagree with me later. All right, I got the mic. <laughs> all right, so, um, am I safe? Can I go out? How bad is it? Is it over? These are all real questions, and we should be sensitive to them um, as they are points of opportunity to encourage people and to create a greater capacity for God in this time of opportunity. Phobic behavior happens when we become focused on one thing and that changes the quality of our life and our ability to relive and relate to other people. Right? Um, if, if I am afraid of spiders, right? What's that? Arachnophobia, right? Then, then if I go into a dark place, right, my quality of life changes. When we went to, I, I've been not east a lot. I've been to Missouri, I've been to Oklahoma, and I've been to Louisiana, where I was actually out moving around, right? And, and I've never experienced a chigger, but I knew they were there. And so when I went out in the woods, I I, I was just itching. I'm just like, I get chickens. And like when we went to Louisiana, man, I love the fish. We got this creek. We go down, and I knew there was chairs there, and I'm just like, but it's winter, so I'm like, these things are hibernating. Well, then I got into the ticks, and so then everything I felt was a tick. Right? I wasn't even enjoying being outside. All I was doing was looking for ticks and chickens. It's phobic. When you focus on the thing. It, it diminishes your quality of life, right? And determines how you 
can live. And the ability to recognize that, and rather than making light of it, to view it as an opportunity and to go, well, like, like the devil is trying to suck the life out of everyone that he can, everyone, whether they know better or not, right? And, and that is the opportunity that we're given is like to recognize that and go, wow, seems like there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, aren't you uncertain? Well, I'm uncertain about some things, but there are some things in my life that I'm not uncertain about. And those are the things that give me life and they give me hope, right? Because this is rock solid and it never changes. Um, social distancing, just kind of interesting. And it is why it is prudent for the season. Um, but for some people, it, it, it transforms people into carriers rather than human beings, right? Right? And you, and you recognize, it. wow, looks like you've got a lot of uncertainty. But yet we need the connection. So anyway, all, all this to say, this all creates opportunities. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a really encouraging statistic here, right? And and this is this is just kind of a I found during this time I've tried to find ways to bring perspective, right? Sometimes you just have to be able to bring perspective. And this may not want to be the first thing that you throw out there, but 100% of people experience physical death. <laughs> wow, this is the greatest message I've ever preached. <laughs> it's not an option unless you were Enoch or Elisha. Even Jesus had a physical death. It's how you get there that is the unknown. There are thousands of ways to die, and you don't think about most of them, yet they are just as real and possibly more near than COVID-19. Okay? This is a perspective, because if you don't keep perspective, like fear likes to move in, phobic behavior likes to move in, but if you look at the reality of, wow, each and every one of us is going to die. Why do you say that, Pastor Brent? Why do you say that? Because every time I go to a hospital and I walk down the hall, I look in the rooms and I see people who are touched by pain and by death every day. And we never think of that until it comes near us. It's a reality. It's a reality. Uh, the, what has happened over the last six weeks is just people have had to face their mortality. Like we're not immortal, right? This, this could get me, but yeah, so could a lot of other things. And so I'm not going to allow this to create phobic behavior in my life that takes me away from people who need hope. Will I use wisdom? Sure, I will use wisdom. But will I share hope? Will I engage the opportunity that I'm being given? Point B. You have learned to exercise caution. Or um, have you learned to exercise caution without losing your ability to live and function with other human beings? This is one of the greatest opportunities for the church to lead and be fruitful, probably the greatest opportunity in my lifetime for the church to lead and become fruitful because there are so many opportunities. Uncertainty and uncertain times have never stopped the church that Jesus built on the rock. We are called to walk in the certainty and nearness of the one who gave his life for us and who was raised to life. Forevermore. And I'm not asking anybody to be weird or hyperfaith spiritual. I'm just saying we must be ready to be led by the Spirit and willing to step into what He is doing. Right? And, and when we say that, being led by the Spirit, I think sometimes you have to create a framework because, I mean, I've known people who said, man, I'd, I'd lay down my life for God, right? But during this time, if their neighbor across the street needed help, they wouldn't have gone out to help. So they really wouldn't lay down their life. 
right? When it becomes real, then then it's not so real. It's like, yeah, if somebody was pointing a gun at me, okay, well, that's one way to go. Yeah, but what if you had to get sick? No, <laughs> I'm just going to stay in the house, all right? But here's the reality. Here's the framework of what we're called to. Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with that's the framework of what we're called to, right? And so when we, we look at the reality of the thing that's going on, it's just kind of self-check. We go, God, am, am I in that place? Am I able to do that? If, if you ask me to step out in the face of adversity, would the phobia take over or would I be led by the Spirit? And this is where I said, I'm not asking you to be weird. I'm not asking you to produce something or show people how spiritual you are, but if the Spirit of God moved on your heart and he said, go minister to that person and it didn't look good, could you or would you? Right? Because there is great opportunity, but it must be grasped. And, and this is what we're called to. Romans 8, 14 and 15, for those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Father, Father. And so what does it look like um, in, in real life application? I mean, what's this? Because, you know, when, when I was... Um, when I rededicated my life to the Lord, um, I, I sat under some amazing people who taught and, and taught the Word of God, and, and I enjoyed that. But the problem is, and, and I really try to be cautious when I do this, I have a picture, right, of God and, and what He's doing in my life, but that picture has come with time, and it's come with transformation, and it's come with Struggle, And so I see God in a different way and I can say things and I know exactly what I'm saying according to my picture. But if you don't have the picture, you might not know what I'm talking about. So I hear these people and they give this, this picture and I hear these amazing words and all these things and I go, yeah, I need to live like that. The problem was I didn't know what that looked like. So you know what I did? I made it up. I think this must be what they said. And so I'd go do that. And, and now God has spent 28 years trying to unwind that ball of yarn and take all that misplaced good information and get it in the right places. And uh, so, so I'm always trying to go, well, when I communicate, am I communicating this in the simplest terms possible that are clear and not dependent on you being able to know what my picture looks like? Or have I explained the picture well enough that you really do know what it looks like? And so what does being led by the Spirit look like practically in life today in buying up opportunities? Well, uh, to me, it looks like a prayer that I need to pray often. I want to give you this, this little prayer. I just I kind of wrote this down, but this is something I pray often. Holy Spirit, help me to walk out the door today in the empowering confidence of your nearness and your plan. Lead me into the things you have prepared for me to walk in and away from the things that paralyze me and cause me to be ineffective in the Spirit-empowered life. Say that again. Holy Spirit, help me to walk out the door today in the empowering confidence of your nearness and your plan. Lead me into things that you have prepared for me to walk in and away from things that paralyze me and cause me to be ineffective in this spirit-empowered life. Never forget our definition of leadership. Um, and it's been a while since we covered that, so I'll kind of give it to you again. Um... God given influence to create a greater capacity for good in the lives 
of everyone we touch today. As leaders don't create followers, they create a greater capacity for good in the lives of others. And so God has given us his influence, the influence of his kingdom. He has given us his spirit, right? And he is near and he is with us. And as I go out the door today, I'm saying, God, let the influence that you have given me of your kingdom create a greater capacity for you in the lives of everyone that I touch. I don't know what that looks like, but I know that you have prepared opportunities if I am willing to buy them up. But I also understand and, and I'm not just talking about what's happened in the last six weeks, but there are things that paralyze me, right? There's things that I'm phobic about. And, and I'm like, God, lead me away from that and just help me to see the opportunity. Help me not to see the thing that causes fear, but help me see the thing that causes hope and faith, right? Lead me that way. And so that is, we are all called to be leaders, Leadership is not authority. Leadership is influence. There are people with authority who are not good leaders, and there are people who do not have the authority who are great leaders, right? Because they have influence. Influence um, creates leadership. Influence creates a capacity for good in the hearts and the lives of others, and God is calling us to lead during this time, to take the influence of his kingdom to create a greater capacity for him in the lives of everyone that we touch. Here's God's mission statement for our lives, right? Here it is. This is kind of, it's kind of funny in scripture. You go, you go, well, well, you know, what's God's plan for me? Well, here it is for the whole body of Christ. God kind of gave us a mission statement. You can find it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. It says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of his visitation. Very great picture of leadership. There's a great picture of, of you know, when it says keep your behavior excellent, that's not just talking about getting everything right and acting right. It's like looking for the opportunities and saying, God, help me to buy up the opportunities. Help me to walk in the reality of your nearness. Show me your way so that I can walk with you. God, what are the things you've prepared for me ahead of time that I might be able to walk in? Right? And that what it says in Ephesians that you are Christ's handiwork recreated in his image to do the good things which he prepared in advance. For you to walk in, right? I think God's prepared some things for us to walk in. Amen? Yeah. Man. Is it that bad today? <laughs> right. Yeah, you just spread out. You can't hear me. All right. So, um, Solomon relates some amazing insights for us as it has to do um, with the sureness of uncertainty and how we should respond. And so I, I really want to, I, I guess, when you when you leave today, take this with you. Um, God has called us to lead. God has called us to take his influence from this place and to go out right, and touch other people. And people are being impacted by uncertainty. Remember that. It's uncertainty that it's affecting them. Um, no matter where they get their uncertainty, that's what's really moving our nation right now is uncertainty. The world. And Solomon said, listen, the only thing that's certain is the uncertain. And, and he talks to this a little bit. I like this passage of scripture. It's got some, some interesting things in here. But Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 through 6. And I think it's interesting because Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes is a funny letter, right? Um, 
and you can really get your wires crossed in there if you're not careful. Everything Solomon says um, isn't an assertion of truth, but Solomon is looking and he's going, listen, I've tried all of these things, and what it comes back to every time is there is no life, there is no happiness, there is no joy, there is no fulfillment outside of God. That's what it comes back to every time. But Solomon looks and he goes, listen, uncertainty is certain. But in uncertainty, a person who belongs to God should live this way. And what he says, in essence, as you go through it at the end, but that you should never get locked up and stalled during uncertain times because there is always opportunity in uncertainty. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6. Cast your bread on the surface of the water. Like, that's an uncertain thing to do. Like, I need to eat my bread. What happens if I throw my bread away? Well, he says, well, he says, if you cast your bread upon the water, what's it, what's it going to do? It's going to come back to you. Right? That's what he says. Cast your bread upon the surface of the water, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. Right? So in the face of uncertainty, what does he say? Move. Continue to be productive. Continue. Don't get locked up in this one thing. I, I, I like verse, verse 3. This, this one really ministered to me a couple of times. If the clouds are full, they pour rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. How did that minister to you, Pastor? Well, <laughs> If the clouds are full, it's going to rain. Did you get it? Like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. Why not? There were clouds and they were full. What happens when the clouds are full? It's going to rain. Right? Quit moaning and groaning. Keep moaning. Right? The Bible tells us, don't use this as a manual of escape. Right? People go, man, there's bad things coming on the earth. Yeah, it said they would. Well, how do we get out of that? We don't. We don't. We, we live and we shine. That's where we shine. That's where the opportunity is. And if you're trying to get away from the opportunity, then what's the point? This is not fire insurance. This is God near creating hope in you, in the opportunity. If the clouds are full, it's going to rain. When it rains, it creates opportunity. And if the tree fall, you know, I've got some trees that I've really enjoyed. Like even when I go on a walk over here across the road, I'll be walking along. All of a sudden I look and this wind blew over this great big tree and I just get this sense of sadness in my heart. I'm not a tree hugger. I just look and I go, man, that was a great tree. That was a great tree. You know, and you can stand and you can lament that all you want. But what Solomon says is, listen, the tree's on the ground. What are you going to do? Are you going to cut it up? Are you going to use it for firewood? Are you going to turn it into a house? It's an opportunity. Yeah, I'm sorry that it happened, but this is what it is. So what, how are you going to move forward? Right? It, it's, it's, it's Joshua leading the children of Israel, and, and Moses dies, and the children of Israel boo-hoo for 30 days, and finally God shows up, and he says, Joshua, Joshua, listen, Moses is dead. Tell him it's time to go. All right, so Solomon says the same thing. You know, if the clouds are full, then they pour rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls towards the south or the north, whether the tree falls, there it lies. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Right? What does uncertainty do to you? What's in your wallet? Right? It's like, it's like if you say, well, I, and, it, and it's kind of like, I'm, I'm not, but it's just as a pastor and a church, and people go, how do you make your decision <clears throat> about when to start? I go, well, you got to start someplace. Right? The tree's on the ground. What are you going to do? Let's go. Let's go. Let's, let's see what, what, what are you going to do? What if this happens? What, I go, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like this Sunday is my barometer for how we're going to move and what we're going to do from here on out. I don't know if 200 people are going to show up and huddle up and cough on each other. I don't know if they do. We'll do something different next Sunday. <laughs> Maybe I'll be in jail. <laughs> he who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Just as you do not know the path of the wind, and how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. 
God is moving and working and creating opportunity. Am I looking for it? That's good. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed or whether both of them alike will be good. Solomon tells us that uncertainty is sure, but not to be paralyzing. We are called to move in the face of uncertainty because of who it is we move with, right? And I, and I want you to, to just consider, because even though we get this from Solomon, and Solomon can be kind of goofy, and Solomon really straight, but who is really leading in those words that he spoke. And that is the spirit, right, of God that was speaking through Solomon. And he said, you're going to face uncertainty, but in the face of uncertainty, don't be paralyzed because you are being led by me, right? And, and that is where I have to know. I have never been in a place of uncertainty. Like I gotta make a decision and I'm nervous. And I'm like, my, you know, you know how you get your guts get all tied up and you don't know whether to go right or left. And you're just saying, God, just tell me what to do. Blah, 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 blah. And like, I'm waiting for the experience to happen and I'm all locked up and seized up. And God's just saying, well, just move. Well, just move. Well, what if I make a mistake? God goes, well, I'm big enough. And I got it. And if you make a mistake, you're not going to fall off the face of the earth. Just move. Just move because I'm near. I'm near, and I'm able to use all things for my good if you love me and you are called according to my purpose. That's the promise. Just move. I'm near. Don't let the uncertainty of the situation lock you up. Sow some seed. Do something. Go, man, God, I don't know, but I'm not just going to stand here and be phobic. I'm going to move. And I'm trusting you to lead me because you are near. You don't have to get in your chariot and come from heaven. You're right here, whether I can feel you or not. Lead me. Lead me into the things that you've prepared for me. So back to Philippians. Back to Philippians. We never did really get to finish Philippians. But I'm going to pick it up quickly. Try to put it down quickly too. <laughs> oh, Pastor, you're such a crack up. <laughs> Philippians 4. Verses 4 through 9. What, a, what an amazing passage. It's probably been preached a lot during this time. I haven't touched on it too much, but I've just come to enjoy it because um, when I did get a chance to share a little bit of this on the video, um, it, it grabbed me and I actually had uh, Oak Stewart contact me and said, wow, that really, really grabbed me when you said that. I'm like, me too, because I read it and I forgot that it was there and all of a sudden there it was. And it talks about the Lord's nearness. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. 